1. I worked in a hotel bar, super ritzy place. There was a room that was over 5k a night and a shot of alcohol that was 1k USD for a little over two years and have hundreds of stories. However, I'm going to start off with one of my favorites. At the hotel, there is what we call a party shift. Friday and Saturday night where people go out and get hammered. During said party shift, we get together with the bar manager and a representative from the private security in charge of the property. We are connected to local police through the radio, and PD has specific posts they work at on property. We are also connected to the control center that property security runs from. After a portion of the rush was taken care of, I had the opportunity to go out for a lightly deserved smoke break. The smoking section is beneath the balcony of the bar. While I was shooting the shit with a co-worker, I heard the crash of a bottle as it fell from the balcony. Oh shit, time to get back to work, I thought, as it's never a good sign. When I got up to the bar and made my way through the crowd, I spoke to MK, one of my officers with a good eye for dumbassery. At the time, he was relatively new, so I was unaware of how good he was at spotting dumbassery. So I gave him an update and asked him to keep an eye on the balcony. He did so and not even a minute later he came to me saying that he saw someone throwing a bottle off the balcony. We approached Coke Guy and I escorted him out. This is information after the fact from MK. Apparently Coke Guy tried to sell alcohol to a bar patron as a bar patron. It's illegal in my state. The bar patron said no but I am going to get security. After which Coke Guy decides to throw the bottle of alcohol off the balcony and say For what? In this bar, we have a sign at the exit for people leaving that states, No alcohol beyond this point. One of our ways of keeping this place state legal. As we pass this sign, Silver, my second in command, who is by far the most professional, helped me escort a coke guy out. The coke guy must have seen this sign because he reached into his pocket, pulled out a little bag of coke and said, I don't have any alcohol, but I have this, and flicks the bag. At this point, I radioed property security, and they sent Tower over. Tower, an officer who worked private security for the property, also stands about 6 feet 8 inches. I got this guy out on the second floor, and he wandered off. When Tower showed up, I updated him and gave a description. By this point, Coke Guy returned and shoved a group of random people out of the way, stating, They were in my way! As if he didn't do anything wrong. I proceeded to talk to the group he shoved, and Tower spoke to Coke Guy. You know that one guy in your team that not a single person will screw with? That was Tower. Mainly because there wasn't anyone even close to his size, but also because he's a giant teddy bear. But Coke Guy was pretty much ignoring Tower to the point where he just walked away. Tower got the police on the radio, and they met him at the Sky Bridge. I got this group to calm down, asked if everyone was unharmed, told them we were handling this guy and that if they wanted, they could file assault charges. They declined and we moved on. I turned around to see Coke Guy peeling off the sky bridge while Tower was speaking on the radio. At the end of this incident, he was trespassed from the property, but the police released him because the amount of coke in the guy's possession wasn't enough to prosecute. They did confiscate his coke, though. But wait, there's more. Coke Guy comes back to the property, finds the officer who confiscated his coke, and asks, Can I have my coke back? PD arrested him for violating a trespass, and it turns out he has warrants for his arrest in other states. All in all, the last time I will ever see Coke Guy. Mm, probably. 2. Background Info My first security job was a lobby position at a chemical plant. Took the job because I was a broke college kid that needed better income than what was offered at my local fast food joint. I later was hired to be an in-house security and medical hazmat coordinator, which I did for two and a half years. Management later decided to dissolve that position and use contacted workers instead because it was cheaper, so I was let go. Overall, great introduction to security and medical work too as I later got into EMS and got into nursing school and everyone I worked with was pretty competent enough to do their job. The only issue I had was this one person who fell asleep on the job a few times, and also a coordinator. I was given managerial duties, but couldn't make hire and fire decisions. So that sucked not being able to fire this person, 
only write reports about their poor behavior at post. Second position was an international biopharmaceutical plant under a different security company, because the pay was better. But it ended up being the worst. First off, they hired me for the wrong job. SOC officers aren't the same as SRC operators. I was made an SRC operator, even though I had no experience with mass telecommunications and Everbridge. But left because of crappy management and being forced to do other people's jobs. In my position, I would be in an office with the SOC officer who did site-wide duties, whereas I took care of international stuff. Mass alerts, scheduling evacuations, informing people of power outages, earthquakes, riots, etc. And all the SOC officer had to do was watch cameras of the site. I was part-time because I was still in college and only took this to help pay for student debt. The SOC person would leave for four or five hours at a time, and it got so bad that I reported it to management. But because we were a union site, there were issues with firing this person, so instead I left. Not to mention everyone who worked at that site hated the job. But I met a celebrity in the security LEO CO field while I was there, so that was pretty cool. That being said, I've had about three years of experience at this point, so I thought I knew what to expect, but I was poorly mistaken. My last position was for the same security company as the first, but I was placed in a secret tech site and patrolled to a large local transit facility. The one that had just a mass shooting in California, that we had to sign NDAs for and not disclose what the site actually was. The set we had to was full of the most gung-ho guards that lacked common sense. Like they would show up in plate carriers and have tack belts and were unarmed. I'm current military reservist, and even I didn't take the job too seriously. In like one of the safest towns in the area. Now, these people were completely incompetent. And we had one situation that completely shook me to my core. Across the street one day, I was on blind spot watch which is when we watched the side of a building that didn't have any cameras, and witnessed a woman kick a child in the chest three times. I radioed it in to the SOC as per our standard operating procedure, which states that only SOC should make contact with local law enforcement, and they didn't do anything about it. I followed up and told them that I would follow the person, even though they were technically off base, and would follow up with further information. I ended up making contact with the kid, who was probably around four or six, and his mom called him and he looked down while he ran towards her, obviously a little scared. So I radioed the SOC the situation and gave them a description of the car they came out of, and they decided to wait until they had gotten the go from our supervisor to call the police. Our supervisor was in the garage, and the radio signals don't reach there, so probably a ten to fifteen minute window. And while all this waiting occurred, the woman and child left. Flash forward 20 to 30 minutes later, after I made the first call, they finally contacted the local PD, which was literally down the street, not even a block away. When the cop came, he looked at me and asked why I didn't call it in sooner, which I said that I informed the SOC office of the ordeal and that it's their job to call it in. When he then turned to them and the supervisor, it was all excuses such as, Oh, well, we had to wait for express consent of the supervisor because it was off property. To which the cop replied, Well, if someone was shot right off the property, would you wait to call it in? They're both felonies. I later got word from management that the woman was arrested for child endangerment and abuse because there was bruising in various stages of healing across the kid's body consistent with recurrent child abuse. However, they had to get a warrant beforehand, because she had gone home already by the time the cops had followed up, which muddied the entire process. The woman ended up having to go to jail, and the kid was placed under CPS. But man, I can't believe that it took that long to call proper authorities. If you see someone getting attacked, don't just stand around and wait until the crowd clears to call the cops. It just goes to show that most sites just need a warm body to fill positions. If I were to do it again, I guess I'd call it in regardless of what the SOP says. I'm starting a new job in security as a CTG, and this popped up in my head as a reminder to always do my best, and to do what's right, regardless of what procedure states. 3. This happened in the winter of 2003, when my family was returning from a vacation, 
My wife, 41, my daughter, 6, and myself, male and 41, got to the airport, returning our rental on a beautiful morning before 6 a.m. When our airline would be opening up their check-in, I guided them in, there in their normal early a.m. semi-stupor, I am the only morning person in my family, and we waited at the desk, one suitcase each. About 10 minutes later, a TSA supervisor, think 30-ish man who looks quite a lot like Maui from Moana in TSA uniform, arrives. He is another morning person, so he and I strike up a cheerful conversation. About five minutes later, his junior agent, svelte woman in her mid-twenties, grumpy, groggy, with Anne desperately clutching her coffee, arrives and gives him a grumpy, grumpy, grumpy good morning. We both grin at her, he returning the greeting, with that utterly aggravating cheerfulness that morning people reserve for non-morning people, whom are feeling martyred. She went and manned the x-ray machine, grumbling maledictions under her breath, and started to work, and the supervisor and I went back to chatting. Grumpy ran my wife's suitcase through, but when she scanned my daughter's, her eyes went very wide, and with a voice cracking squeak yells, CHECK! Maui whirled and looked at her, seeing her frozen and staring. He turned to me with a raised eyebrow. Any idea what this is about? I shook my head. No. A pause. Internal motorized machinery and a toy? I suggested tentatively. With a no-nonsense voice and a determined expression. No. Then he strode to her position. I was astride behind him. He opened the suitcase, reached in and pulled something out. In a voice of bemused and mild annoyance, Maui said, What is this? He held up the toy pedo that he had pulled out. I tilted my head down and let out a quasi-embarrassed laugh. <laughs> I'm so sorry I forgot about that thing. Toy pedos look like an 82mm mortar round made of heavy foam rubber. That is called a toy pedo. It's a pool toy that, when you throw it, goes in the direction the front is pointed when it hits uh, it's, it's the water. Maui looked at the red and orange toy that he was holding and a grin spread across his face. I gotta get one of these for my six-year-old son. Grumpy started muttering. Yeah, they are pretty cool. Then he looked a touch embarrassed and shrugged. Sorry, but I gotta do a chem test on it. Fed regs. I smiled and raised my hands palms up. Live wildly, I said. With a grin and a flourish, Maui pulled out a chem strip and swiped it on the toy. I looked at it and nodded. Yes. Just as I thought. Traces of water. And with a laugh, he put it back into the suitcase. I laughed as well. His junior TSA agent looked like she wanted to kill us both. 4. This story goes back to the early 2010s. I was working at a condo property. Three towers with a central parking area. The clientele were denizens of affordable housing. Think Section 8 for you, Americans. Basically, there were good people. Some people living there were on assistance, and there was a lot of illicit activity on the property. Security office was in Tower 1. One guard on comms, CCTV cams, one on patrol. There was a nice and early 2 a.m.-ish one Saturday morning, halfway through patrol of Tower 1. I get a call saying there's something happening in the lobby of Tower 3. Looks like a fight. I head that way and sure enough there are two combatants, both absolutely blitzed. You could smell the booze as soon as you entered. One in his early twenties, the other looked fifties. I later found out they were a father-son duo. Eh. After confirming that the police were on their way, I watched the old guy go down and the young guy put the boots on him. At this point I intervene and try to talk the winner down. He's done, he's had enough, you won, no need to keep it up. The guy just says, You want some too? And takes a swing. Now, I've been a student of jiu-jitsu since I was a kid, and taking this dude down was trivial. Holding him down since we didn't carry cuffs, I kept trying to talk him down until I feel a hand roughly grab my shoulder and try to pull me back. Rule number one in a fight is your opponent has a buddy. Believing this to be the case, I unloaded a nice combo of elbows and back fists completing it with a throw over my shoulder. Ha ha! I stand up and ready for the two-on-one. I notice the one landing is a uniformed police officer. Well, 
Damn. The cop gets up, scrambles for his cuffs and taser. I should mention this dude, despite being built, has a baby face and looks like he's fresh out of school. His obviously older and more experienced partner actually got a chuckle out of it. I got cuffed, while this kid actually went off on me about how I was being arrested for attacking him. I suggested he identify himself before placing hands on someone, especially with the situation. It devolved into a shouting match that the older officer had to intervene in, and ended. EMTs had been called as well, and were looking at the older guy who actually had the nerve to say I attacked him, and the kid, the one I was restraining as the police entered, simply was trying to defend his dad. Thankfully, CCTV footage told a different story. The two went to the tank for the night, and I was given a lecture slash warning to watch who I place my hands on. A closing point. We called the police for a mundane incident a couple days later. I got the same officer. Some time had passed, I cooled down and realized my conduct wasn't perfect either. I was able to pull him aside and apologize. He told me not to worry. He was new and had learned something himself that night. We shook hands and we were fine for the rest of the time I was there. 5. I'm a security guard that does events like concerts, car shows, etc. Each guard is issued a radio, a walkie-talkie, so that we can, you know, talk to each other if something comes up. We have earpieces so that we can hear the radio even during the music festivities. I'm currently working at a family-friendly event that has an absolutely zero tolerance for alcohol policy. If we as security see alcohol being consumed, we 100% have the right to confiscate it and throw the offender out. We have police doing patrols with us as backup if someone starts throwing punches. I was doing a walk around the event just being a presence when this kid, EK, comes up to me. He's about nine. What are you listening to? I'm trying to figure out what he's talking about. Oh, this? I point at my earpiece. Yeah, obviously. I'm not listening to anything, mate. It's my radio. So are you listening to music? No, it's my radio. Like a walkie-talkie, but better. He completely and utterly ignores me. I want to listen too. Proceeds to try and grab the cable linking it to my radio. I pull away. Buddy, you can't have it. It's not a toy. He immediately wails like a banshee and runs off. I think it's over and continue doing my patrol. Not 20 seconds later, over storms this lady that doesn't even look like a Karen, but is already red-faced and shouting. Is this the man? Points at me while E.K. nods. How fucking dare you make my son cry? All he wants to do is listen to music, which you shouldn't be doing anyway, and you make him cry over it? Ma'am, please do not swear at me. As I was trying to explain to your son, this is a radio or walkie-talkie so that I can talk to my co-workers. It is not for listening to music. Bullshit. Don't you fucking dare try and lie, you stupid. Then she said she wanted to see me next Tuesday. I don't know why people keep saying that. It's weird. Something I should have mentioned is we split the venue up into zones 1 to 10. We're currently in zone 7. She also stunk of alcohol. I say into my radio, Please assistance required in Zone 7 for removal of intoxicated individual. This apparently sent EM into a fury as she started yelling and trying to grab at my radio. How fucking dare you lie straight in my face, you stupid piece of shit. Give me that fucking music thing. She starts trying to rip out my earpiece and pull on it, and causing me quite a bit of pain, as those are designed to stay in. The police officer arrives and orders the EM to get on the ground. She curses up a storm while alleging that I tried to hit her and steal her radio. Arrest him! Go over his radio and get on the ground, says the police officer. EM lets go of the cord but doesn't get on the ground and starts smirking. And looking the most smug I've ever seen anyone as if she's one. Police officer walks up to her and starts to handcuff her. Which she apparently didn't see coming because she starts screaming bloody murder and trying to hit and kick at the police officer. Me, after recovering from her assault, assists with arresting her. We get her in cuffs, and has been taken away when she looks at me, and I couldn't help but put on the biggest smug smile I've ever done. Cue her going even more crazy and saying I started it and I was trying to sexually assault her. Several people all say they will back me up, as she was apparently causing a scene with several of the other families around her. 
I don't know what happened to the EK, and to be honest, I don't really care. But hope he's well. Thanks for listening. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to Insecurity, number two. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. Especially you heroes that swooped in at the last minute and helped me replace the stories I had to dump for transphobic reasons. The stories were transphobic, not me. just want to be clear on that so there's no misunderstandings. It's the kind of thing where it's, it's like one line in a story that kind of slips you by because, you know, when you're first looking for stories, you're reading them, but you're, you're kind of just skimming over them quickly to get the gist of them. Um, and that kind of thing can slip you by, but there it was. And I thought that would, firstly, I didn't want to do it, but that would be really fucking inappropriate on the first day of Pride Month. And this channel and its host, not the word for me, host, narrator, sex god, I don't know, is very much LGBTQ plus friendly. Right, no birthday singing today. I, oh, I'm kind of sad about that. Not to worry, there'll be another one in a few days, though. I believe the 5th of June. Ish. Uh, this coming Saturday. Why did it feel like Wednesday? Ah, that's why it feels like Wednesday. Because it is 10 past 11, so we're not far from midnight. Okay, right. I'm going to stop yammering on. Uh, basically, happy Pride Month to everybody. I wish you all joy and cookies and love uh, in that exact order. If you don't get them in that order, I will be disappointed in you. Okay, and with that, I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourself.